like to welcome everybody to this podcast um, today. This is a conversation between myself and Professor Hilary Pinnock. Hilary has a GP of long standing uh, with a and is also a clinical academic at the University of Edinburgh. Her passions are around supporting self-management and implementation research, which I will get Hilary to explain a little bit more to us uh, as we go through our conversation. Welcome, Hilary. Thanks, Linda. It's lovely to be here talking to you. So first of all, I think, wonder whether you could tell us something about your career pathway and what led you to do some of the things that you've <laughs> chosen to do. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I... The way that question's asked, it almost sounds as if I planned it in advance. I'm not sure that I did. Um, I made a decision to study medicine. So mm -hmm. clearly that was a defining moment. Um, I loved science and I loved biology and it just seemed a good career pathway to go down. Um, I don't think at that point I decided whether I was going into primary care or secondary care specialist. I, I had made no decisions on that at all, but I found myself in, in primary care um, and have loved it and been, as you said, I think for many, many years, best part of 45 years as a GP <laughs> in several different practices. Um, I've always loved, I've loved science. Um, I love projects. I love managing projects and coming out with answers so possibly it was not entirely surrprising that around my, my 40s um, I started to get involved with um, academic um, research this actually is one of the many advantages of being a woman um, I had a young family and I opted to work part-time to work half-time for many mm -hmm. years um, of course, there comes a time when they uh, start to not need mum quite as much as they did. Um, and I filled my time with audit work locally um, and then later on with research. So I kind of sidled in sideways mm -hmm. into an academic career. Um, and then as, as time has gone on, that's become more and more important. So I've gradually shifted from being one time I was a three quarters time GP in a day a week um, as an academic. Now I'm it's the other way around. I have a day a week in my clinical practice and I'm the rest of my time is, is academic and research. So it's just kind of happened. Um, I'm not sure whether that's quite the right answer if you look at textbooks, but it's certainly what happened to me. <laughs> It's a perfect answer because I think very often people think that there's a textbook career mm -hmm. ladder or pathway. And the more people that I talk to, the more I realise very few of us have ever <laughs> taken that route. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. So how would you describe your leadership style? Oh, um, I think I'd like to say collegiate. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't read the textbooks on leadership, um, so again, my terminology may not be quite right. But to me, leaders have got to lead. You know, you, you've got, I think you lead from the front. You, you have to lead. Mm -hmm. um, and the buck stopped with me as a leader. Um, I, in the end, it's my responsibility. But I have long since realised that there are many people in my teams who know more than I do mm -hmm. about all sorts of things. Um, you know, whether that's statistics, I don't pretend to be able to do statistics, anything more than extremely basic. So I have statisticians in the team and I turn to them. Mm -hmm. um, health economy is something that's so important and it's a it's a specialist of its own. And I can't do that. I have colleagues to help me. Behaviour change. I'm working increasingly with um, health psychologists and they can teach me a lot. So if it's behaviour change, I need to listen to them. Um, education, as you know, Linda, we I've been working with um, mm. experts from Education for Health to advise me on education. I don't pretend to know how to put together an educational mm. package. Um, trial management, some of the organisation, some of the finances, I need somebody to explain the spreadsheet to me. So yes, the buck stops with me as the leader, the principal mm -hmm. investigator in a project. But if we're going to make the right decisions, I need to be collegiate and listen to the team. I don't know whether that fits management style, um, you know, sort of as described in the textbooks, but that's but I, I, I think it. it's really it's very interesting because you describe listening as really important. That's one of the things that a lot of people find really hard to do. Yeah, yeah. But, and particularly as you get busier and busier. Hmm. 
Um, and we've all seen it in our colleagues, and I hope I'm not falling too much into that uh, into that trap as I get older. But, you know, you get less time, you're busy, you're asked to do too many things, mm-hmm. um, and you find yourself thinking, well, I've got to make this decision rather quickly. Whereas just that little bit of extra time allows you to listen. Mm. I think that's a really important point, isn't it? Because these busy lives that we lead and, Mm. you know, politics, economics, they all can change in a matter of minutes these days, so it seems. So So how do we help people take the time to do what they need to do? Oh, I don't know. What happens, of course, is, you know, ask a busy person. If you want Mm -hmm. something doing, ask a busy person. And of course, if you have achieved something you've delivered something then next time somebody wants something doing they come to you and say can you do this and if like me you like saying yes um Mm. you end up with a lot to do yeah um that's challenging i don't know that we stop that really (laughs) i don't know i'm sure you're right we can try though can't we that's the important thing we do see colleagues who are certainly busier than they can manage i think we've Mm. all had that experience Mm. So as you were kind of growing up through your career, were there any role models that uh, came to play? So many, really. I I, I wouldn't say one. You know, I wouldn't say that's my role model. Um, You know, clinically, I had two colleagues I would just highlight, perhaps. The first was very much at a domestic level. When I was um, a a very young mum, in fact, just about to be a young mum and I was thinking now how am I going to cope with a baby and a clinical practice I was planning to go back half time um and you know as a young mum it's difficult to envisage how you will do that and I my partner in my practice was a lady who had five children two parents and a dog and I thought to myself well you know she can do that I can manage I can manage one one baby um so just that expectation having watched her manage that mm-hmm. um and juggle that i thought well yeah of course i can do it um so i think probably that was a role model many years ago now um clinic academic less clinically perhaps the second clinical one was probably a colleague in the next practice i moved into who was a um a gp trainer um and i learned quite a lot from him about you know following dreams really um because he was always very keen for me to take you know if you want to do this do it you know Mm -hmm. um I at the time long-term condition care proactive long-term condition care was very new I'm going back now to the 1980s um and I said you know I think we need to be setting up asthma clinics diabetic clinics and he said well do it then you know do it do you need some training what do you want to do do it so I think that kind of attitude Mm -hmm. um was something I I kind of learned from him Academically, um, probably the person who's influenced me most, and there have been many along the way, um, is uh, Professor Aziz Sheikh, whom um, I suspect you know, Mm -hmm. many people know. um, And Aziz has always been a a mentor to me. He supervised my um, MD thesis. And um, he's, yeah, he's one of these very, very busy people. Mm -hmm. But he's always had time to be supportive. And perhaps that's another quality of leadership. Supporting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. So do you think uh, women and men lead differently or do you think it's a a bit of a smokescreen? Yeah, I do. I try not to go down that line, really. Mm. Um, Mm. I think we all have different styles of management. Um, I can think of men and female managers, leaders who have, you know, been the same and been different. I'd I'd rather not go down that line, Mm. really. Mm. It's interesting, isn't it? There's a lot of focus at the moment on how different the sexes are, but yeah, we all yeah. have the same attributes. It's how we how we choose to use them quite yeah. quite often. Yeah, and perhaps how you know schools in the past have probably behaved differently. I mean, when I was at school, um, we had single sex schools, so the girls' school and the boys' school were separate. Now maybe that leads to yeah. to some differences in in the way one learns at that very young and impressionable age. Mm-hmm. I think that's changing now. I think the schools are um, joint, and I know my my daughter and her husband are very keen to make sure that their children are, you know, a lot of what they do is gender neutral. Yes. They were talking young children here, you know, so right from yeah. the beginning. Yeah, no, absolutely. So in terms of um, decision making, I think a lot of the people that I talk to who come on our leadership courses are actually 
think that making a difficult decision is something they have to do all by themselves. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just wondering if you could talk us through an example of a difficult decision that you had to make at work mm. and how you navigated your way through that. Gosh, I don't know that I've got one difficult decision that I, I make. I, I, think, I think the first thing to say is, that, is to acknowledge uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You need to be very confident in acknowledging what you don't know and what isn't clear yet. Our politicians make this mistake. They feel they've got to know the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes answers are clear. Sometimes you've been there before, you know what the answer is. It is very clear. But sometimes it is not clear what the answer is. And whether that's in clinical practice and I'm seeing a patient and I'm thinking, you know, I'm not quite sure about this. Just making a diagnosis of asthma is really not easy. It's not always clear. And I think sharing that uncertainty in a confident way so, you know, not in a fluster, not, oh, dear, I don't know what to do, but this is challenging. You know, there's this, there's that. This is how we're going to sort it out. And that might mean looking something up. That might mean reading something. Um, it might mean context of asthma to come back to that. It might be, look, this is a variable condition. I need you to help me monitor this over time. Mm. This mm. is how we're going to sort it out. So it's around the confidence of being uncertain i don't know whether that makes sense no that makes perfect <laughs> sense and i think there's an assumption from many people that you have to know the answer rather than yeah. it being okay to be uncertain but yeah. managing that uncertainty it's managing it's being confidently uncertain mm. um sounds a bit like ws gilbert doesn't it really but it, it's around being I'm con I do not know the answer to this. This is why I don't know the answer. And this is how we can move forward in order to find an answer. Um, mm -hmm. And we'll do this together and seeking advice and recognising that sometimes the decision you take today is not necessarily the decision that's going to be right in a mm -hmm. week's time, two weeks time, six months time. And that there may be things change, things evolve. Absolutely. Yeah, that, that's really good. So. What what have you found difficult and how have you managed your way through that? What do I find difficult? I find it difficult to say no. Mm -hmm. um, and back to being too busy um, thoughts. I, I like saying yes to things. I think grasping opportunities is what makes a career work. Spotting mm -hmm. opportunities and saying yes to them. But uh, the, the the other side of that, of course, is that you then have to learn to say no sometimes and you have to. And I find that very, very difficult. Um, and you have to learn when to deem it from a role as well as when to take yes. it on. Um, and I think some of the the fixed term um, roles that we have in some committees, for example, where you do it for three years, actually suit people like me, because at the end of three years, I'm not thinking, oh, dear, should I give this one up to do something else? Mm -hmm. Because that's the end of it. So I think um, I think saying no, stopping what I'm doing in order to create space for something else, the most difficult decision was it difficult? No, it was an inevitable decision in the end. But the one that I found most difficult to execute was when I decided to retire. I use that word very clearly in inverted commas because I certainly wasn't stopping work. But I decided to retire as an equity partner in the practice. Um, I was half time and I went down to, in fact, one day a week as a salaried partner. And that felt like a huge stopping um, and I found that extremely difficult to actually execute. Um, it was absolutely the right decision. I'm delighted I did it. This was nearly 10 years ago now. It's been, you know, it enabled me to increase the academic work, which I absolutely love. So it was the right decision, but it was not an easy one to actually execute. So what helped you through that, do you think? Because that's one of the things that people are constantly asking me. How do you do? You made the right decision, but how did you actually get yourself to that point? Um, I suppose I'd, once I've made the decision, I've got on and did it. Mm. Uh, you know, the, the worst decisions are the ones you haven't yet taken. Yes. Um, once you've taken the decision um, and you've told somebody in the practice, for example, um, or you've signed on the dotted line at the university for increased hours or whatever it is, you've taken the decision and it might be, you know, emotional or traumatic or whatever to do it. But once you've done it, you've done it. Mm. Mm. 
And again, opportunities don't come up to do that sort of thing all the time. So, you know, you've got to do it at a certain point. So, yeah, absolutely. So how do you maintain balance in your life? As some would say I probably don't very well. Um, <laughs> Well, I, I love what I do. I love the challenge, particularly of academic work, um, which is so varied. It's not doing the same thing each day. My projects are all different and increasingly I'm doing work globally, which is even so exciting and so interesting and challenging. So what keeps me on the ground? Um, I guess it's family, really. I've got two lovely grandchildren. Um, and really, you cannot fail to be distracted by grandchildren. And you do want to do <laughs> things for them. Um, so, you know, that definitely <laughs> keeps me very balanced. So, if you could find a word to sum up your career, what would you say it was? Sum up my career. The word I've used quite a lot, well, I, you sent some, some questions that you thought you might cover, and the word that kept coming to mind was was taking opportunities. As I said right at the beginning, I, it wasn't a planned career path. This is something that just happened. I got into my 40s. I was part-time in my practice. I got involved with the Primary Care Respiratory Society. At the time, it was called the General Practice Airways Group, but it was, say, that group of people. Mm -hmm. Opportunities arose to do some research. They had a research um, weekend, a research workshop. I signed up for it. Um, and out of that came the telephone review trial that got into the BMJ, out of which I actually then wrote a dissertation for my um, MD thesis. Um, and that in introduced me to a lot of people, including Aziz that I mentioned. Um, I then there was an opportunity arose for um, to to join his team in Edinburgh. So I took that opportunity. Um, Global work has just become an opportunity with international primary care respiratory groups. So I sort of put my hand up and said, yes, I'll help do that. Um, it's taking opportunities. Um, more recently, the European Respiratory Society, I was asked to stand for a, um, originally just as a group chair. And I said, oh, well, yes, OK. Um, and that led me to, on to other things. Mm -hmm. So, yes, it's, it's opportunities, seeing opportunities, going for them. And delivering, of course, it's no good mm. going saying yes and then not delivering. But <laughs> brilliant, absolutely. So, just before we wind up, what would be a, a key piece of advice you might give somebody who's starting out on their career in the health service? Oh, enjoy it. Continue to be excited by it, by interested in it. You know, it there's there's, there's doing it, uh, and that's important because the pleasure I get from a patient who's it happened to me two or three weeks ago. Some two or three patients came in one after another and said, you won't remember me, but 20 years ago, you looked after my mother when she was dying. And you think, gosh, that stayed with somebody. So enjoy what you're doing. Um, Recognise that you can make a difference, even if you don't always see it every day. You are making a difference to people's lives, to touching people's lives. So enjoy a career in the health service. Be inquiring. Don't assume that what you've always done is right. So think about how it could be done better. Be inquiring about what you do um, and go for opportunities. Look for opportunities. Join professional groups and professional societies where you can exchange ideas and just take yourself out of your day to day practice for a day or two. Um, so all of that and, and say yes to opportunities that excite you. Go for it. Think think later how you're going to do it. You know, say yes and then work it out. <laughs> Professor Hilary Pinnock, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Linda.